and welcome to the Donahue Group. We're delighted that you can join us uh, again. We're uh, together for a half an hour's worth of discussion of topics of great and monumental interest. And uh, we, we hope you enjoy our, our pitter-patter and our conversation. Uh, our group tonight, Cal Potter, former state senator. Tom Paneski, professor of math at UW-Sheboygan. Ken Risto. <laughs> I'm sorry. She's Who turning has... the nurse ratchet here on us. Um, Former is the... Do you really want to know my title? Do you really I, want to know I, my title? Would you just tell us your title? My title this year, because it changes every year with okay. no change in pay, I might add, to the Sheboygan Press, um, is, uh, what Think am about I called? It. No, I'm, Think I'm a about it. No, I'm a curriculum and assessment specialist in social studies. Curriculum Next and assessment? Next year, I will be the only curriculum and assessment specialist. All right, for the entire world, and so we're happy to see that. It's a my heavy <laughs> burden on my shoulders. My name is Mary Lynn Donahue, and I'm a lawyer here in town. Um, or Nurse Ratchet, as we call her lately. <laughs> Keeping the this, insane asylum working. Well, there you go. Um, and we're in fairly insane times, uh, and part of that is at least some sanity, on, in my opinion, on the part of the jury in Madison to find Scott Jensen uh, guilty of, I believe, three felonies of misconduct in office, high, high crimes and misdemeanors, uh, but actual felonies. Uh, in our last show, we had talked about you know, what were the odds because he was presenting an interesting um, defense, which is, boy, everybody was doing it. What's your problem? And um, at least, as far as I understood from reading the newspaper accounts, implicating at least half, at least half of the assembly <laughs> and assembly staffs in, in exactly that kind of, uh, kind of behavior. We had talked that he might, at the, toward the end, cop a, a plea of some kind, uh, re reach some sort of agreement, but no. And the jury was actually out for quite a long period of time. Those of us who do jury trials know that as a prosecutor, the longer your jury is out, the more trouble you have, and um, so, I had some concerns about the t you know time going on and on and on, mm -hmm. thinking maybe the defense would work. What do you think? Well, I was concerned too when the jury was out as long as they were. But after I after the decision was rendered, interviews with the jury really impressed me. The, the uh, magnitude of the of the uh, study that they did do while they were uh, deliberating. They requested. Uh, testimony from many, many people who had, had come before them, and they really did a good job of making sure that the decision they rendered is one that they were in found footing with, and they did find him guilty. And we had predicted, I think, as you mentioned last time, that uh, he'd probably cop a plea simply because um, it would be, be come forth with a less sentence as a result of this. I mean, when you look at the other three now that have cop the plea, uh, what they've gotten is a fairly light sentence, really, considering what they were charged with. Now this judge is really has a burden because he's got a jury decision of three felony convictions, and what do you do now as far as a punishment compared to what Koala was charged with originally um, in, in rendering a, a decision which will, or a sentence which will come down in May. And as I remember, Koala was sentenced to nine months in jail with Huber release, mm -hmm. so he can go out during the day and... And Burke Work? was sort of at uh, what was it, an Did ankle bracelet at yeah, home. It was pretty much house arrest. Yeah, I think it was. Mm -hmm. It was fairly lenient way in a way. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what do you what does this judge do now that the, the jury has really clearly said, yeah, he screwed up. He he misused public funds, he misused public employees, he's guilty of three felonies. Now does this judge say, Well, I have to compare this to the other three? Or does he really throw the book at uh, Mr. Jensen? Yeah. Well and and at least on the federal level where there are certain, some would say draconian sentencing guidelines and mandatory minimum sentences. But I think in the federal system, he'd be going to prison. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think there would be much question of that. And uh, so it will be interesting to see uh, what the judge does, uh, does do with it. Um, I have to think there's some prison time here. And as opposed to jail so. time, you know, prison in the, you know, the Department of Corrections. And I can tell you there's no Huber Law <laughs> uh, release privileges. Uh, and uh, I think that will be, it, it, sh it, it should be a signal that we can't do business like we used to. What do you think uh, in terms of um, the, the, I just followed this with great interest in a number of the editorials and news reports and so forth. Uh, columns seem to indicate that um, uh, 
the um, How Can Legislative Politics Get Healthy Again was the title of, of one of the, the columns. Another one, uh, um, After Jensen, The uh, Crisis Remains. That was uh, an editorial of the uh, Wisconsin State Journal saying that John Gard uh, certainly has not disavowed uh, Jensen's um, well, obviously the, the specific issues are, have been disavowed, but he could not bring himself to um, uh, suggest that a convicted legislator might want to consider giving up committee assignments that continue to put him in a position to abuse the public trust. Guard said it's too early to know exactly all that stuff. I'm not going down that road. And among the four of us here, representing all sorts of different political views, um, it just doesn't seem like I mean, the most obvious problems are, are cured, one would assume, but I mean, has trust in Wisconsin government been restored? Uh, is there a different way of doing business? I don't have any problem with the sentence. Uh, the sentence. I mean, one of the jurors said it was the, the volume, I guess, he, at least uh, the, the juror that I heard. I mean, no one, no one event was the, the major cause. It was just that there was an accumulation of a lot of little missteps and everything else, which shows a disregard for the campaign finance law or whatever it is. Uh, uh, and so he's convicted. And if everybody else does it, maybe that'll, they're just, thank good, they're just saying thank you for, it's not me, I'm not on the stand and mm -hmm. being reviewed by this same jury. Mm -hmm. So maybe they'll change their habits. And uh, so Jensen is the, uh, Fall guy. Cal, you were there. Well, I, I think uh, Guard's behavior during this whole thing just shows that the money machine is still in place. And uh, they may just be more careful as to whose phones they use and whose office they use and whose staff is taking vacation when they're doing what they're doing, but they're still uh, running a money machine that shakes down special interests for big bucks to run for public office. And in this case, Gard is running for Congress, so he needs bigger bucks than he needed to uh, run for the state legislature. So yeah. he's he's going to he's got some of what of his own behind to, to cover here because he needs to <laughs> raise millions of bucks to run a uh, congressional campaign. So we need campaign finance reform. Yeah. That's what we need. It really it is the bottom line. But sure I remember is. Jensen's testimony, or part of that theory was, is that you could not tell when campaigning stopped and legislating started. That, you know, people worked hard, but that the whole process was so intermixed and was, you know, it was hand in hand together that you couldn't separate it. You couldn't say, gee, when I go home tonight, I'm gonna make my political calls, I'm gonna see what money I can raise. And it was just, the, the interlock was so tight. But I think that you've hit the nail Cal and it's campaign finance reform. If you've got a, if we're going to spend twenty-eight million dollars on this gubernatorial election, people got <laughs> got to be out there raising that. Sure. And uh, and I know. think his his comments were just indicative of how entrenched and arrogant uh, a lot of the politicians have become. And when you, I mean, I obviously would know the difference between using a phone to raise money in your own office and using your home phone or making the call at home versus making the call out of your office or asking your secretary or one of your aides to go do something political at two o'clock in the afternoon versus six o'clock or seven o'clock at night. There is a line that, that has been crossed here and I think the entrenchment of those type of activities was so great that the time and money and place and, and being respectful of the institution of government became so blurred that that's why these comments, I think, were made. Yeah. Is it diff more difficult a line between constituency service and the sort of things we normally you know, expect our elected representatives, representatives to do and raising campaign funds? Sure. Is that line as far, you know, when more you blurry or about the same as, as camp you know, campaigning and, and, and doing legislating? which I kind of separate the two legislating, I mean, law writing as opposed to constituent service. Well, I, I think there's a line. I think uh, I've been out of it a, 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 a while now, and I didn't have to raise a million dollars for a state senate campaign. My last raise cost me $44,000, so, and I was a low spender at that time. But uh, so I never had to 
shake down a lot of people. I could do chicken dinners and that type of thing on a very local <laughs> level and raise $44,000 and write letters to my friends and other people mm -hmm. and get the money. But uh, when you start talking about millions of dollars, yeah, um, yeah there's, a, there's a melding there of uh, if you need to get a check from a special interest group of twenty or $30,000, uh, you may then start, uh, as Koala was doing, saying, well, do you want to play ball? Here's what's going to be happening to your legislation if you do this. And so I think the lines were crossed and in many words, not only the institution of using the state capital and the state phones and the state employees, mm -hmm. but also the you give us this and I'll give you this started uh, getting in. And it, as Mary Lynn has mentioned, it all gets to be when you start rating one million or 10 million or 20 million or whatever you have to raise, uh, you start getting into activities that are more strong-armed, more pointed, and eventually really illegal uh, yeah. to get that type of money. Let me um, ask you this. I, those of us who pay attention to politics, I think we're kind of fascinated by everything that was going on. Did we see any outrage on the part of Wisconsin uh, citizens in general uh, about uh, how I could this have it, happened yeah. to our clean, post-Lafollette government? Yeah. And I think that's why the legislature doesn't do anything. I mean, no public exactly. financing bill advanced in the legislature. That's true, it did. And why? Because I don't think they, they see their constituents probably, say, a pox on all their houses, Democrats, Republicans alike, all politicians. And if that's the case, where's the constituency to say if they don't take this up, there's, some, there's hell to pay at the, can, at the election time. There isn't. It doesn't appear to be, at least. There really doesn't. No. Um, well, I'm not getting that sense at all either. Yeah. It's almost as if we walk around and it's sort of... Uh, as voter, as citizens, we at, at one level expect government to be honest, but we're not in the least bit surprised when it's corrupt. Yeah. And because we're not surprised, we're not outraged. Yeah. And I think you're right. I think that, I think Tom is right. Is that there? But the grace of God goes I. You know. And yeah. thank goodness. And maybe. And I'll I'll be a little more careful and maybe a little less blatant about it, um, for a while and hunker down till the next guy gets caught. And sort of like speeding on the freeway, you know, you just sort of try to stand <laughs> under the radar screen and hope you're not the one that gets pulled over by the state patrol. Right. As a prosecutor of traffic offenses, I can <laughs> tell you the number of people who came, yeah, come in and say, but everybody was going as fast as I was is typically... Car blew by me just yeah, a minute ago. Yeah, yeah, that's right. typically not a defense that I or judges uh, pay a whole lot of, uh, mm -hmm. a whole lot of attention to, and, and yet... And it seems to me, when we think about all the money that gets raised, what does it get used for? It gets used for pretty manipulative, uninformative television commercials. Right. Right? Yeah. It's morning in America, and you, you know, wave a flag or play a nice song and, and this, that, and the other thing. Uh, I mean, there's some other campaign activities ads appear in newspapers and yard signs, although the bigger the campaign and the, and the farther away from the hometown, the less you see of that. But all these millions and millions and millions of dollars go to TV ads that do not inform the electorate. In fact, they seem bent on misinforming. Mm -hmm. And that's even more irritating. Mm -hmm. uh, so that we have this corrupt system to raise $20 million for the governor's race so that we're all subjected to $20 million worth of bad TV commercials. Well, I mean, but don't they have offices in various cities uh, and they have to staff them and they oh, have sure. to have phone banks sure. and they certainly want to pay people to, well, not, maybe these are volunteers, but then they provide them food and lunch. And so there is oh, some know. legitimate where I mean le legitimacy, where the money goes. I mean, sure. they're, they're and lately I'm not even talking to a tel uh, to a person when I pick up the telephone. Oh, I know it's a you know, it's a I'm, tape recording. I'm actually talking to George Bush in the last presidential <laughs> election. He's actually calling my house. Yeah. Um, that that's right. Kind of yeah. sets you back, doesn't it, a little like, bit? Whoa. You know, <laughs> whoa. That's true. Right? <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> I'm sorry. Good to talk to you. <laughs> uh, but he. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's and, and and what we're also finding out is is that if if both sides are raising twenty million dollars and they're both throwing a lot a lot of, you know, negative campaign ads and I know that's in the eye of the beholder I suppose but uh, pretty much people didn't end up just throwing their hands up and saying I can't I can't make hides or tails out of any of this stuff about who's lying about what and whom and, and they just walk away even more frustrated and more cynical about the process. Pay really less attention to the real, what right. the issue practically really is. I'll mm -hmm. never forget the first time I saw the Swift Boat ad 
and I think we were on vacation someplace, or I was in a, I remember being in a motel room and sitting and watching this ad, and I turned to my husband and I said, that's it, Carrie's done. And it was. He never, ever got back. And, you know, it took him three weeks to respond to it. And, uh, you know, say what you, I mean, it was, it was a powerful ad that did not advance the public discourse, to put it mildly, in my opinion. But these are powerful things, you know, these powerful images that are created. And, and it leads us to a government that's just, you know, a mile wide and maybe an eighth of an inch deep. And, and it's, it's pretty discouraging from my perspective. See, and it worked, but it works in, in another way, a similar way, but in, in an, another odder kind of way. You remember Russ Feingold's first, um, mm -hmm. you know, first mm -hmm. campaign where you had two people, it was in a primary situation, where you had two people just throwing all sorts of negative ads. At, and, mm -hmm. and, and Russ comes on, quite honestly, and had a great ad campaign where he just basically stands around and, you know, they, they used, I think he used mashed, dark and mashed potatoes, you know. But I didn't know anything about what Russ Feingold stood for. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what his positions were. All I know is that he was the guy that I guess that wasn't throwing mud. Now, yeah. I, maybe you should vote for a person on that basis. Maybe you shouldn't. But I don't find that too an informed uh, type well, of television either. It was clever. I mean, yeah. Russ's second one is, you know, here I'm yeah. going. The fact that I remember it and all of oh, you yeah. too yeah. tells you how yeah. powerful brilliant. it is. It was brilliant. Going to Green Bay, going to Wisconsin. Well, yeah, it's brilliant in the sense that it was entertaining and amusing. But the, the plain fact of the matter is, is I didn't find it all that informative about what, what Russ voted for, what, he, what his vision is for the next six years in the Wisconsin Senate. It's like who has the best Super Bowl commercial. Exactly. Yep. You know, and, and if your candidate comes out with a brilliant commercial, like I know Wisconsin, like the back of my hand. Sure. I mean, I'm thrilled. I'm delighted. Swift Boat ad comes out. I am in dismay and absolutely mm -hmm. convinced that the election is over, and I was correct. Um, but... You know, Super Bowl commercials are one thing, but electing you know powerful people to run the country. Well, in any event, getting down off the soapbox. Yeah, that's it'll... The, the, yeah the elite, <laughs> the elite talking. <laughs> but, no, no, that's no what we are. We're the I have to say, I have to say, in the last we're election, the field. We, we just you know. In the last election, I thought Ron's. I thought I thought Russ's ads were a little more informative. Uh, and, and still very, very visually uh, interesting to look at. There was, I remember one where he was sitting in a crowd of people and his criticism of his opponent's uh, health care proposal was it, it didn't address the needs of large numbers of people and he kind of just stood up and said, you know, all of a sudden he just pops up and, you know, you got the message very quickly, rightly, again, accurately or not accurately, that at least there was a substantive policy discussion there or something that we could talk about. But I think the English system is and I don't know the details. All I know, it's very brief, three weeks, six weeks. Mm -hmm. And I would like, my proposal is we'll have as much free speech as you want, but not on paid TV. And you go six weeks, <laughs> and you put your position papers out there. We'll invite all the candidates to come to the Donahue group, where <laughs> they you can, go. in yeah, a learned can. and calm and respectful way, lay out their agenda for, for the future. And, make our decisions that way. Face the fierce onslaught of our rapier-like questions. There you go. Right. Yes. Are you pro-choice or pro-life? <laughs> okay, that's it. Or, pro, or <laughs> pro-funny. Pro <laughs> so in any event, well, moving right along, because things are funny on the uh, state level, we have a couple of referenda coming up in the November election, time just in time for the governor's race. I love it. One is the death penalty. Uh, an advisory referendum on reinstituting the death penalty in Wisconsin, which has not been in place, I believe, since 1853, mm -hmm. uh, when the spectacle uh, of the whole process was convincing enough to the electorate to stop it. Uh, of course, coming hand in hand with the, uh, the Avery issue, I'm, I at least was not surprised, and also the gay marriage um, um, referendum question um, are, are both interesting. I think the death penalty one, uh, because of the context of the Avery Hallbach matter, has some legs this time. I agree. Yeah, I just agree. It's I a, mean, that was... It's I pretty mean, visceral, the, huh? Yeah. The reading about it, I mean, I read about it. I mean, it was just, yeah, gruesome. I mean, you think, does he, you know, the death penalty is warranted. It was just a gruesome uh, kind of uh, activity. Mm-hmm. It's really a shame that it's coming, and the push is coming at this time. I, I think the topic deserves a more cerebral uh, look. Um, one of the interesting aspects about the 1853 
constitutional prohibition against death penalty. It came from the electorate. And it came because people at that time were executed by public hanging. And the hanging that got the people upset was, I believe, in Racine or Kenosha in public square. The person who was being hung uh, dangled from the rope for a very long period of time before they died. Mm. And the, even the crowd who came there to observe this spectacle as a sort of a sporting event, I'm sure, um, mm -hmm. were so outraged. And the newspapers then took off and had editorials saying, mm. this is barbaric, that a society that uh, purports to say the greatest crime is killing somebody and goes ahead under the public auspices of dangling somebody from a rope for so many minutes to watch them die. Uh, this is just abhorrent and it ought to stop. And it did stop mm -hmm. by constitutional amendment. And now we're seeing the steam uh, trying to be generated to have an advisory referendum that if passed, will then put pressure on legislators who previously were on the fence or mm -hmm. uh, uh, had inhibitions about reinstituting the death penalty, putting pressure on them saying, see, you're against your constituents that passed an advisory referendum, therefore you need to get on board and pass this constitutional amendment to reinstall the death penalty. If memory serves me right, Governor Doyle, as opposed to the death penalty, is this a, a, a clever ploy on the part of Republicans, Tom, do you think, to uh, put him on the why spot not? in a... Right. Like, hey, why not? Meet, it's not the meeting, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sounds Tell like us a, what you know. Sounds like a good ploy to me. <laughs> Yeah, if, you're I, for, I mean, if he's not for the death penalty and I am, well, then why should I vote for him? Mm -hmm. Why not? I mean, it, that's politics. And I, I, you know, like you just said, the, the citizens and the local people rose up against the death penalty back in 1853, was it, did you say? Well, the citizens could rise up again and say, I think we need to reinstitute it. And that would again be legit. The, mm -hmm. the, the citizens uh, have a voice in making uh, decisions about what goes on in their state. It would be nice to have a, as, as Cal pointed out, a more cerebral discussion about <coughs> just what's involved. Well, what's involved and in killing somebody? I mean, when you kill somebody in 1853, it was there for everyone to see. Today, by lethal injection or in some states still by um, electrocution, it is done with the witnesses of the warden or a few people. It's cloistered away, no news media. Yeah. People don't know what goes into this barbaric act of killing another human being, human being. And that's one of the things that I don't think will enter this debate because it is so sheltered. Mm -hmm. I'm strongly opposed to it for a number of reasons. One, I don't think a society that says murder is bad ought to get in the business of killing somebody. Uh, so another reason is it, people say that it saves money. Well, actually, to build death roll, maintain death roll, pay for all the appeals, there isn't a lot of savings, net savings, uh, than keeping somebody locked up. But uh, and also, there, another thing a lot of people don't realize is that there's probably been, what is it, 30-some people over a certain number of years that were found subsequently to uh, have been con killed, executed, when they were actually innocent. And we're also, there also have been some convictions where the person who they purported to have been, ha, had been killed has found and shown up later to be, still be alive. So there are a number of instances where the justice system has not been perfect, and I don't see that it's getting any, any more pure and perfected uh, to warrant reinstituting of the death penalty, in my opinion. And, and I would pile on, okay? I'd, mm -hmm. I'd add a fourth, and that is those people who are executed across this country are people of color and people who are poor or mentally retarded or mentally diminished. Now the court may or may not, we don't know what the, where the court's gonna go on that issue, the Supreme Court. And so when you start seeing the, the when you start seeing the discriminatory effects of that, of that program, that, that, that makes me uh, nervous. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I know that there's, there's studies on either side about the deterrent effect. I think it's odd that if we really want this thing to be deterrent, then we should go back to public hangings again, or public, not so much public hangings, but you know, let's strap the gurney out in the middle of Madison and let's have this televised. Uh, I'm sure Fox and other, you know, I'm sure Fox and the other channels will cover it because it's nothing like just everything else we've seen on TV. It's blood and gore. If it bleeds, it leads. And let people actually see this execution for what it is, if, if it's going to be deterrent. I mean, well, I, mean, I sort why of, hide it behind? I sort of, no, this But not, does anybody really believe that Avery was, if he's, if he's guilty of what it is he's yeah. charged, he's, you know, allegedly, does anybody really believe in their heart of hearts that he did this mental calculation in his head about, well, listen, if I really get caught doing this, I'm going to be probably, ex oh, wait a minute, I can get, I'll do this in Wisconsin because it's only going to be life. Most people, I, most <coughs> people don't really go through those calculations of deciding whether they take yeah. a homicide or not. I mean, we wish people were that rational. 
Well, and we wish that there is at least some rational discussion back and forth mm -hmm. as to the pros and cons and, and uh, so that it at least does not become pandering or a ploy. Uh, but that we actually or have viewed as the cure all. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. I think the things that I brought up, innocent being executed, or right. the discriminatory nature of it. I mean, an O.G. Simpson of the world who has resources to hire the best lawyers right. will not die. A Klaus van Bulow will never die. Those oh. people will never die. And and if, if that's all exposed and we get a decent ruling by the electorate that's informed, I think that's that's what we should strive for. And neither will Tom Delay. How did that guy win that primary? <laughs> But that's for another day. It became a loyalty test. <laughs> there you go. Successfully spun as a loyalty test. There you go. We only have just a, a little bit of time to cover a bunch of other um, uh, issues. The Attorney General's race entered uh, Sheboygan County. The Sheboygan County Bar Association hosted three of the actual candidates, and Peg Lautenschlager, as one of her deputies, was, was here. Um, I was not able to attend that bar meeting, but I understand that the discussion was lively. Um, <laughs> Time is short, but do you think Peg Lautenschlager gets through the primary against Kathleen Falk? Well, I only know what I read in the paper, and I know that the drunk driving uh, conviction was very heavily played upon by her opponents, and I think it depends probably on how visible that is in the people's mind when they go to vote. Um, I think they're forgiving to a point, but they also expect the, the uh, chief justice uh, officer of the state to, to not... Uh, be involved in crimes and being convicted of crimes. So I, I think it uh, depends probably how much that issue is is played. I mean, otherwise, uh, Peg has done, I think, a, a good job in her job. I mean, she, she, has. she she's, a, she's a good person. She works hard. She made a mistake. How many people will forgive her for that mistake, I think, depends on how visible that mistake is drawn out uh, over months and before that election. Yeah. How's Kathleen Falk? I mean, I kind of <clears throat> noticed her a few years ago. I kind of liked her. She's a, a pretty formidable character. Yes, we only have a, less than a minute left, but you know she came in on that governor's race like gangbusters and uh, really uh, got a lot of traction fairly quickly. And um, so my question, okay, so I wanted to hear that. Mm -hmm. So would Doyle like to run with Kathleen, or would Doyle like to run well, with Loudon Flagger? And I'm no guessing it would be Kathleen. Mm -hmm. Clearly, clearly <laughs> yes. no love loss between Doyle and, and Loudon Schlager in any event, and then then of course there's the problem of the drag on the ticket. We have so much to talk about, we have to wrap it up, but we're coming back. So thanks very much.